Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I am the Crypto Crow here live with the amazing, brilliant Charles Hoskinson. So stick around. We'll be right back after this brief disclaimer. If it's full of bear, I don't care. It's quite a rough ride, just like life. But I'm kind of patient, cause only time will tell. It's gonna go up, so you better stay calm. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm super, super pumped. Today's a big day for King Cardano. Uh, Charles, welcome, man. You've been all over the freaking world. How are you still awake? I, uh, I, it's great to be on. It's, uh, it's always nice to be on your show, Crypto Crow. We finally made it happen in June. Uh, for, th for those of you who don't know, I promised that I'd come on the show in June. And it's, it's what, the 30th today? So Hey, man, we made it. We made it. We made it. That's the important part. You, you even messaged me. You're like, Crow, I, I promised you one in June. Let's do it tomorrow. And so yeah, exactly. here we are. On Sunday. On Sunday. So, uh, yeah, I just got back. I, uh, I, was in, uh, I was in Japan, Georgia, Israel, Washington, D.C. Uh, it was a crazy trip. I, I just kept getting sick on the damn trip. I started with gout. Then I got a chest cold. <laughs> then I got a stomach flu. <laughs> I was like, this is horrible. I'm just picking up everything. Oh, my God. You got to carry what Z packs with you everywhere you go. I don't, would that even help you? I, I don't know at this point. I don't know. I think it's one of those things like radiation exposure that's cumulative and over time it just gradually kills you more and more. And, uh, or you're maybe just I'm, building immunity. So maybe the next exactly. trip around the world, you won't catch anything because you'll already have conquered it all. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But a very productive trip. We met the prime minister of Georgia. We met a lot of great business leaders in Israel. Uh, I met Steve Wozniak actually while I was in DC. It was total accident. I just ran into him and I was like, Hey, Woz. And he's like, Hey, I saw that so, picture. Uh, yeah, it was pretty cool. I was like, just, just of all people in the world to run into, you know, it's like, okay, he's, I, guess this, he, I guess this is what we're doing now. I, I, I love Wozniak, man. I, unfortunately, it's like all of his thunder was stolen <laughs> in a way. I mean, he's really the guy that kind of built and created everything, but he wasn't right. exactly the face. So he's not he's, the, you know. He's doing okay. They pay him a lot of money to go to conferences these days. And he oh, just really? goes from, yeah, he goes from one after another. So I uh, I think if you got paid what he got paid, you'd be a very happy guy. Yeah, and, uh, I imagine. He's, he's invested in a lot of stuff and. He's, uh, he's very successful in his own right, and he's a very happy guy and, and incredibly pleasant, easy to talk to, and really interesting. Still cares about technology. Sure. I mean, it's easy to kind of get, you know, disconnected and check out after you get to a certain age, but he's just as giddy today as he was in his early 20s. So, uh, you so sir just a seem wonderful quite giddy. Day. You seem very chipper. Like, you, you've had a good weekend or something. You're, you're quite no, chipper. No. No, I'm just recovering. You know, uh, uh, it's Sunday. It's a beautiful day outside. Uh, you know, I'm really enjoying just being home and, and being able to relax a little bit. Just but, glad to be uh, home. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If I if I if I leave the house by the time I've had like if we go to have dinner, I'm already done. I'm like I'm ready to go home and go back to. I couldn't imagine <laughs> right. doing everything right. that you flying all over the country, yes. and the world. <laughs> See, you see, your problem is you live in Ohio. You see, I live in beautiful Colorado. Oh, tell me about it. I tell my wife all right. the time. I want to get out of this cesspool of boredom. Like, right. there's nothing to do here unless you like live bands or museums. Or you like to eat. If you love to eat and you want to get fat, move to Cincinnati. Because this is 
you know, that's pretty much all there is here. So what you're telling me is you can see a band live at a museum while eating. Pretty that's, much. I'm that's sure that's that the happens. Cincinnati experience. Pretty much. <laughs> there's there's not much else. I mean, they're doing a lot of really good remodeling, revamping. Like over the Rhine used to be like right. nuts. Now it's beautiful. All kinds of little trendy spots and it's just more places to eat though. Like everything is another restaurant. Right, right, right. So, well, they did the same thing in Denver with the gentrification of the Lodo area. It used to be just like homeless people in warehouses and drug dealers, and and now it's it's one restaurant after another restaurant after another restaurant, and yuppies everywhere. Pretty they, much, they, they have they have the beard wax and everything. It's, exactly. It's, I don't have my beard it's, wax yet, but I'm working on it. I, I'm going to become yeah, a full blooded hipster here at some point. Don't, don't go down that road, crypto. Bro. Don't go down that road. <laughs> Anyway, so I, I'm I'm really thank you so much for joining me. I know I I send you messages like a like a a bipolar ex girlfriend uh, sometimes when you're out and about, and I you know I know you see everything, and it's like I I figured you know what it's all good. You, you know if you've got something to say, there's something you want to do, you know where I'm at, and it's worked out well. Obviously, chat's blowing up. There's like 400 people so far in in chat, so. Uh, you know, I have a list of, of questions and things, but I, I guess where would you like to start? Is there some? Is there a place where you would like to start? Do you want me to just start hitting you with questions and we go from there? Oh, let's uh, just start with some questions and okay. we can just uh, organically work our way through it. Okay. The number one question that, that uh, I've had asked of me to ask you, which I'm pretty sure I already know the answer to, uh, is when token burn? Is there any <laughs> chance whatsoever of there being a token burn in the future? And if not, why? Why Why does the group, well, why do you uh, feel that it's necessary to have such but, a but, huge supply? Well, well, first off, the supply is distributed. It's in people's hands. So what would we burn? What person would I take tokens from and destroy uh, to reduce the supply? It's not like there's some mystical reserve of 60% tokens sitting out in the ether somewhere that's unassigned or unallocated. This is like Bitcoin. I mean, the, the token is trading, the tokens are in the hands of real life people. They're trading on exchanges. So how, how would a burn even work? A buyback it, perhaps, you know, yeah, some who's sort money? of who's money. I don't have the money. It's not my fiduciary responsibility. Uh, you know, and, and what w the only purpose that would serve is to slightly appreciate the price on the short term and all that money would, would, what would we gain from that? Uh, I mean, it, if it's a good investment to buy ADA, it's a good investment to buy ADA. This should be regardless of the particular supply that's in market. And it, the supply is just a number. I mean, they say, oh, there's too many ADA in circulation. Well, it depends where you put the decimal point. So, you know, move the decimal point uh, a few to the left and you have milli Bitcoin and now there's too many milli Bitcoin now. Oh God, yeah, you know, there's, there's way too many of these, 21 billion of them floating around. You know, that's, that's crazy. Uh, there's, there's too many milli Bitcoin, let's burn some Bitcoin. Well, if you're not comfortable with that, let's just move it you know, the other direction, talk about Kila ADA. Uh, so I think it's just psychological. It has nothing to do with supply and demand. It has nothing to do with the underlying value of the asset. What will produce real value is adoption and growth and real technology and being able to bring millions of users into the system and have those millions of users do stuff with the protocol. And, and that, that's the only thing that's going to create real value. A token burn is, uh, is a vanity thing that's done by certain projects to create short-term boosts uh, for day traders and speculators and, uh, and other such people. And furthermore, there's, there's, there's nothing I can do. I mean, I, I, I'd have to steal tokens from people to burn them. And as for a buyback, there's no giant pool of capital that's available to, uh, to do that. And even if there was, then you'd have to ask yourself, would you rather spend that money going to every country in Africa, building relationships with their leadership and getting tens of millions of people into the protocol or appreciating the price 3% to, to, to buy back 200 million worth of tokens or something like that? Yeah, I think, I think to, uh, a degree it is a psychological thing i mean for me i've never worried so much about a token burn or the total supply or total circulation because i kind of look at cardano as one of those things that's going to have so many uh individual use cases across so many different countries and 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 dApps and different things that you know to me i've never been overly concerned i get it in the sense that people are saying look the less there is and the more 
the more demand rises with the different applications that start to sprout up on the blockchain, obviously that helps the overall value long term. Not necessarily just a short term boost in, in value, but just kind of the whole typical supply and demand thing. But I think when you're talking about how much is available now, you know, cutting a billion or whatever isn't necessarily right. going to help much of anything. Uh, there, there's significantly less feather coin on the market right now than there is ADA. Uh, would you rather hold feather coin or ADA? Right. Oh, I get what you're saying. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's just, it's, it's a vanity metric. It's a, a meaningless thing. You know, when I go to Korea, it's a thousand won to a dollar. Uh, when I go to Japan, it's a hundred yen to a dollar. Does this have any meaningful impact or bearing on the Japanese economy or the Korean economy would if they, if they did a big buyback so it's a hundred won to the dollar instead of a thousand what that suddenly makes Samsung 10 times more valuable mm -hmm. uh, you see so no it's just a misunderstanding of monetary policy and economics and these things are are just crazy things that people ask for that they, they don't really even know what they're asking for there's only a finite amount of money uh, to spend. What we spend at IOHK is money on engineering and science. That's what we do. Cardano Foundation spends its money on uh, driving adoption partnerships and, uh, and the community management components, as well as the legal concerns. Uh, and Emergo spends its money on basically getting ventures to build things in the Cardano ecosystem. Uh, we don't spend money. Uh, it's not our place. It makes no sense to spend place on trying to appreciate the value of the token or to manipulate the markets. You can't do that. Even OPEC can't even fully manipulate or control the price of oil. Uh, nothing would make them happier than oil going back to $148 a barrel. They tried. And this is like countries, nation states with unlimited budgets and huge amounts of control over the supply can't manipulate that. World gold market, all these guys are trying to push the price up. They can't get it up. Uh, so anytime you, you try to- They need Viagra coin. What was that? They need Viagra coin. They need Viagra coin. Yeah, you got to pump it up. Uh, the, 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 but anytime you try to manipulate the price, no matter who you are, you can be the U.S. government, whatever, you, the best you can do is, is control things on the short term. But markets are far more powerful than individuals, companies. They're far more powerful. And gen generally speaking, when you get to a stock buyback or these things, it means you're running out of imagination and ideas. A great example would be Microsoft under Steve Ballmer. You know, while everybody else is spending their money on innovation and building real products, the best Ballmer could do is say, we're just going to buy Microsoft stock back. And the company stagnated and they missed so much. And then they go under Stasha Nadella and they're like, who cares about the buybacks? We're going to go do HoloLens and Cortana, and Windows 10 and all these things. And the company doubled in size and the stock, I think, doubled in value or tripled in value. You know, it's, it's, it's innovation, it's adoption, uh, it's utility and it's growth. And these are the things you have to focus on. And you know, going and getting nations to come in and take the product seriously that have the potential to bring millions of users in. Those are the things we should focus on and, uh, you know, spend our money on rather than trying to manipulate the markets. That's, it's illegal. It, it doesn't make any sense. And uh, even if we wanted to do it, we, we're not God. We can't do that. It, it would only work in the short term and it would only make a very small sliver of people money and the vast majority of people would end up being hurt in the process. Okay. Um I, I just got a super chat question. Pro, please ask Charles what he is planning to do after 2020. Will he stay at Cardano or move on to another project? Contract renewal? Yeah, so that's actually going to be the community's decision. That's the cool part of that question. Oh, you're not going so, anywhere then? Yeah, well, it's up <laughs> to the community to decide. You know, the, the point is that if we've done our job correctly, we should have a working CIP process like Bitcoin has Bitcoin improvement proposals and Ethereum has Ethereum improvement proposals and so forth. We'll have Cardano improvement proposals. We'll have a voting system and a, and a treasury system. And basically that means that there's a way of capturing the intent of the people who hold ADA and use ADA. And there's a funding source available for people to do things for the ecosystem. And so that IOHK will show up and say, hey, we'd like to keep doing what we do. And we'd make the case to the community that we've earned the right to do that. But it's no longer our decision. It's the community's decision. They're going to make that decision ultimately. And they'll say, hey, uh, no, actually, we think Bob over there is more qualified or Bill over there is more qualified. Uh, so post-2020 is not my choice. It's the community's choice. We'll make a bid and we'll see where it goes. Uh, and the only reason we would be replaced is if, honestly, there was better options for the community. So maybe more agile companies, uh, maybe companies offering a different direction. Uh, maybe they want to diversify and have multiple companies and have a lesser commitment from IOHK. 
But I think that's important for decentralization. And I think that's important to eliminate key man risk. You should never have a situation where one party, one company, one group of entities has universal permanent control over the evolution of an ecosystem. Uh, if, if that is the case, you don't really have a cryptocurrency, you, you have Apple. And you know, as long as Steve Jobs is there, it's like everything's great, right? But when Jobs dies and it all falls apart, you know, but no one lives forever. So then you're basically saying, well, this is, a, this is not a permanent ride. It's, it's, we'll see how long we can stay, but eventually the truck has to stop. So is this going to be We're like at, a presidential election type deal every, every cycle or? No, no. It, hopefully, hopefully it'll be one of those things where, you know, it's a continuous thing where we scope out work and we make ballot submissions and other people make ballot submissions and, you know, the people decide. But I think it's the only fair and reasonable way. Uh, and uh, it also gets the community engaged about what is a priority and what directions does the community want to go. So instead of having top-down leadership, you have bottom-up leadership. And it's a little slower. It's a little bit more painful. Uh, but uh, ultimately, it results in an ecosystem that's more resilient and diverse. And that also tells you that that system is going to be around in 50 years or 60 years or 70 years. Uh, and uh, that's, that's what we're striving for. So post-2020, uh, that's the goal. And we'll stick around until all that infrastructure is in place. And we'll be the very first company to submit a ballot. And then we'll just see where it goes. And we hope the community, of course, keeps us around. Uh, that's really interesting because I didn't even really understand. Like when you guys say decentralized, you really freaking mean it. Like, right, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> I got. I I didn't even realize that that was how things were set up. That you that that it's literally all set up so that the community drives the entire train, including it, it, its some, executive staff and everyone else involved. Yeah, well, basically it's, you know, delegative democracies work pretty well. And, you know, the idea is we trust this group to go and do something for a period of time. And here are the KPIs. And uh, then at the end of it, they, they show you what they did. You know, at the end of 2020, we're going to produce the mother of all closing reports, explicitly outlining everything we did from 2015 to 2020. It'll probably be a few hundred pages long. And contain references to hundreds of documents that we or papers we've written and hundreds of thousands of lines of code and all the innovations we brought and say, this is what five years of our time uh, gets you and what we've been able to create and how much money we actually spent and, and so forth. Uh, and, you know, we'll make a proposal of where we'd like to go, what we'd like to do. It might be a smaller commitment, might be a larger commitment. It just depends on where the community's at. And there's also a lot of things that got descoped, like, for example, uh, the K investments. They were just too ambitious, the same for Rena, And they could be brought back into scope uh, once the Treasury's in place, because they will require substantial financial commitments that were above and beyond the original scoping of the 2020 uh, contract. Uh, so, uh, you know, other parties will also come in and there's other companies that are working on Cardano. People tend to forget that. Vacuum Labs is working on Cardano. Atix is working on Cardano. Uh, Kadelsky has been a security auditor now for two and a half years. I just read their uh, audit report on the C bindings we wrote for a particular exchange, uh, a three, four page report. Like, you know, there's half a dozen companies outside of IOHK that are doing active development work right now. And they probably will want to take a more active role for everything from cell phone wallets to uh, to other key pieces of infrastructure in the ecosystem. And uh, in, in it's about time that other people get funding to do that. So it doesn't become a monoculture and it becomes a singular vision around one particular founder. Okay. Um, I have so many questions. Uh, what is the Shelly proposed mainnet launch date? Like that's, Towards the end of 2019 or early 2020, isn't it? No, and it's not going to be 2020. I will eat my shoes if it's 2020. I keep saying that, and I'm going to keep saying it. And I don't like shoes, so uh, that's that's not going to happen. Uh, you know, we honestly believed there was a really strong possibility we were going to launch Shelly earlier this year, and uh, we were operating under that. But there was just certain things that turned out to be a little harder than we had anticipated. But that's the nature of software development. These things happen when you're dealing with new protocols. But with the launch of the self no test net, which is really the first major, major milestone in getting Shelly out, uh, that means a lot of the, the major science implementation complexity hurdles, like getting Genesis running and the, the self node running, they're done. Uh, so now it's, it's, it's more pedestrian work and it's annoying work and it's hard work, uh, but it's not unpredictable work and it's not work that's, that's you know, like no one's done before. 
you know, the, this is the challenge with this project, man, has been that it's a mixture of the old and the new. So there's old things like build a UTXO wallet or build a cryptocurrency network stack or, you know, implement a bunch of crypto primitives. And for the last 10 years, people have been doing this and there's various opinions on the best way of doing it. And there's a, certainly a space where you can innovate and there's some new things we have to do because our protocols are new. But for the most part, that's understandable. It just takes time and effort and you should make sure you audit it to make sure you didn't screw anything up. Then there's a collection of other things which were completely new. No one had ever done them before. Like for example, the Chimeric Ledger idea uh, or the stake pool idea that we'd come up with or Orbor's Genesis or these types of things. These are just new protocols. They're like they didn't exist three years ago. We invented them and they're not simple. If you look at the papers, they're like 60 pages of math. Okay, so you can't just hire a normal engineer and just hand them a 60-page math written in you know, GUC and say, go read this and go, go implement it. They'll look at it and they'll be like, well, I don't even understand what the fuck this means. Right. So, yeah, so you, you, you then need to translate that into something an engineer actually understand and then have a conversation of how do we even build this? And remember, a scientist is not an engineer. So the scientist does things, thinks about things, and writes their work in a way for a particular audience and they're worried about mathematical correctness. And so then somebody else has to do the job of saying, how do we actually build this thing? How do we make it scale? Uh, you know, how do we make it fast? You know, how, do we, how do we cheat a little bit? Like for example, maybe we don't use this particular thing the way that it was written. We change it a little bit to speed something up by a factor of 10. Would this actually remove security or not? So there are some translations that have to be done. And then finally, when you have it, you go build the prototype. Now. This process is imperfect. It takes time. It's iterative. There's things you think could be easy. And then when you start doing them, they just get mercilessly difficult. Or in some cases, you discover that it's just not going to work the way you've built it. And you actually have to go back to the scientists and say, it doesn't work. Uh, it, 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 it's mathematically correct, but it's impractical. So we need something else. And they say, oh, well, shit. And so this is where we've actually been through most of 2018. There was a lot of little fine details that we were going in this epic back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And it doesn't mean anybody's incompetent. It doesn't mean anybody is, you know, they don't know what they're doing. It's just how research works. You know, this is, and normally with a consumer, they're shielded from all of this. When you see the HoloLens or the iPhone or a consumer product, like the fingerprint scanner on the, on the Samsung S10, that's post-research. The R&D is done. That was done in the lab years ago and the software is written. So the first time you see it, it's already gone through hundreds of iterations and design cycles and all these things. The problem is you guys are seeing in the lab, real time, as we're doing it. So as soon as the paper's published, like a year uh, of R&D has been done, and now you're actually seeing real time code being written in translation, these things. And then when it suddenly has a regression and you have to go back to the lab because something didn't work out, then people are saying, oh, well, you know, that must mean they don't know what they're doing. And it's just, it's just an expectation mismanagement issue. But the good news is we've left the lab and you know, these protocols are now dry. They, they're no longer in a situation where we have to optimize them or go back to the lab to invent something new or to change something. We, you know, the self-node test set is a good, fair representation of what we want. Uh, hundreds of people have installed it on many different configurations. They're using it. We've got a lot of valuable feedback. And then the next version is going to be a networked testnet where everybody's connected to the same version of the testnet. And this final version is just going to be fixing the incentives. And then at that point, all the primitives are there for Shelly. And it's just picking a date that makes sense and getting everybody on board. And that's a task because you have to have state pools ready to go. Uh, with the self you know, test net, we've started getting that. We have, like, I think, 1,400 people that are in that channel and there's hundreds of people actively participating. So I anticipate we'll have a huge supply of available stake pools in the next few months. Uh, they're already there and they're starting to grow rapidly. Uh, second, you have to get all the exchanges on board and we now actually have dedicated people specifically for that. One guy's name's Neville and we have a newsletter and we have all these special communication channels for that infrastructure. Let's get all the third party wallet providers on board. You know, there's a lot of logistics that actually go into a huge network scale upgrade and. Uh, you know, we're underway. So I can't give you an exact date. We are officially, it's when it's done and when it's done, uh, but it'll certainly be before 2020. Uh, and, you know, it's it's now getting to a point where it's it's more strategy than it is 
going back and forth between implementation in the lab, implementation in the lab, and uh, and these types of things. It's been a long it's been a long road though, and it's been really hard. And we've we've sh- sure as hell learned a lot about how how to build a cryptocurrency along the way. It's been it's been tough. So I. <clears throat> I, I remember I sent you an article, uh, I don't know, that might have been a month ago or so, and I was saying, hey, Charles, how true is this? And it was basically an article about the proof of stake uh, reward system. You know, what, 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 what are the incentives to the proof of stake system? And these guys really kind of, they, they were trying to, I don't know if it was supposed to be FUD or what. And I remember I sent you the article, I'm like, how true is this? And you're like, it's not, we haven't even confirmed or created the numbers yet really like right. and so you know and i wanted to make sure that we address that because that thing still gets passed around like it's gospel and right. you know and you you in two seconds just basically said no that's not even accurate so right it won't be accurate until the day we launch the main net right because right. then it's real and then people are being paid that said the whole point of having an incentives uh, phase of the test net is to have that argument and that debate. Right. It's not an IOHK decision. This is this is this is the Cardano decision. And you know, we wrote these formal specs. We did all the science. We did the game theory. We we put a year's worth of research effort. About a million dollars worth of money was spent at the IOHK side on scientists' labor fees and these things to get to a point where we feel pretty comfortable about the incentive model. And now it's parametrizable, and we can put in particular values. So when we get to that thing, we'll have thousand plus stake pool operators uh, who are talking about it. We'll have a whole community talking about it. And that's going to be the, the debate of the week, you know, and everybody's going to have an opinion of where to go. And there'll be a hundred articles floating around. And, you know, there's basically going to be a consolidation of what we ought to do. And we have strong opinion of what we think we ought to do, but I think it's only fair to have that debate publicly and, uh, and uh, you know, basically get some feedback from everybody. And then, uh, you know, we'll set it and, uh, at a launch and some people won't be happy some people be real happy and you know that's just the nature of all these particular things but the point of having democracy in the system is later on you can change these parameters if uh, if you want to i mean at the end of the day incentives they're not there to make you rich the point of these incentive schemes are there to operate the protocol right. so basically the stake pools and uh, staking is providing a service it's not a dividend it's not passive revenue you're not just making free money for free money. These only exist because it's necessary for Cardano to exist. Just like Bitcoin has to pay a mining fee, you know, every protocol has to pay for its own bills. Right. And, uh, and so the key with incentives is to build them in a way where you're flexible enough that they can adapt and change as the nature of the protocol changes. Cardano is more than just blocks and it's more than just uh, regular everyday transactions. We're talking about potentially hundreds of decentralized services from Oracle services to payment channels, to sidechain channels, uh, to potentially decentralized exchanges, to timekeeping services like timestamping and these types of things, to random number generation. And so the more and more services that are provided by this system, the more expensive it actually is to run this type of a system. So therefore, the more you have to pay. And, you know, and the more transaction volume the system has, so therefore the more profitable it is to participate and the more competition it is. So the quality of service goes up. So, you know, this is a, this is a business uh, onto itself. And this whole discussion of incentives, it never goes away as a consequence because you're living systems. So what's more meaningful is the process. How do you have that conversation? How do people work their way through that conversation? Because uh, if the process is done right, you can just do it again and again and again as times change and the protocol changes, and you'll always be able to move forward. Bitcoin, for all of its magic and its wonder, it has process problems. And this is why Bitcoin has such a hard time upgrading. There are things that are universally acknowledged as good things, like moving to Schnorr 6, for example. No one in the Bitcoin space says, oh, that's a bad idea. 20-year-old signature scheme, and if they adopted it, they get all this cool new stuff. And even that, the least controversial, awesome thing they could do, super hard to, to get integrated. Took them years just to have the SegWit block size to pay. So one of the things super important to me is that in everything we do, whether it be who's working on the protocol or how we pay service providers to make the protocol great, that there are good processes in place so that it's sustainable, not just for today, but five years, 10 years, 15 years down the road. Um. 
I have an idea. I think what you should probably do is you should speak at Chainwise and announce the mainnet launch in November. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay. So, so basically, even when you guys have this, this model launched, the, the incentives model, all of that, that's right. still subject to change based off of how it's working. So nothing is necessarily ever going to be set in stone 100%. Right. Right. Now, and you know, at the end of the day, you just pick something uh, and then you say, all right, let's go with it. I mean, this isn't an exact science to say that you have perfect models. So you've solved monetary policy, economics and human rational behavior. I was like, it's not possible. You just have a direction and you say, are, are you traveling in the right direction? <laughs> if it's east and you're going west, you have a problem. Right. So, you know, if I'm going east. Even if I'm not on the right road, at least I'm kind of headed in the right direction. So maybe I can get on the right road later on and I don't have to backtrack too much. Uh, and that's that's what we're aiming for. And, you know, it's a game of increasing resolution and you, we get better at it. The community gets better at it over time. Well, and, and here and the one thing that I think people really do need to understand, you know, I, I was actually looking back and I had realized that I had discovered Cardano basically like two months after it appeared. And it was almost right when I first got into crypto. And the, there are a lot of patterns and a lot of uh, methodologies that I've noticed around a lot of new blockchains. And a lot of the blockchain um, infrastructure, their marketing, everything is kind of bent towards uh, building interest through FOMO, through financial speculation, not necessarily on its application or it's long-term development or, you know, anything substantially meaningful, you know what I mean? And so I feel like a lot of people are trying to look at the Cardano project through the same lens that they would look at any typical shit coin that's popped up on the internet over the past two years and not necessarily as something that's going to ultimately establish a fundamental infrastructure on a global scale for multiple reasons and purposes and use cases, not just, well, here's a faster blockchain than Ethereum, or here's a faster blockchain than Bitcoin. And, right. you know, people throwing a bunch of casinos on it and calling it something special. And I think right. that that's something that I think people really need to understand about this project, that it isn't a... Just the same way you're not running around as a marketing genius trying to constantly hype and promote Cardano. When you go public and you're speaking, you're speaking from a very technical perspective on, you know, a lot of the inner workings, the majority of which even I don't fully understand half the time. But I listen and I pay attention because I understand that this is something different. This is something far different than your typical blockchain project. And so I don't look at it in the same lens that I do something that I have a purely speculative interest on. Um, okay. Well, I guess I should get, I have a couple of these super chat questions. So I'll always right. make those priority for people. Uh, with all of your business travels, is it your goal to have many entities queued up worldwide to adopt Cardano once Shelly is released? How is that going? I want to hear well, about that know, eyes wide shut party too. <laughs> 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 I just made my wife watch that movie not even a week ago. She had never even seen it, but she knows I'm a Freemason. So she thought, oh, is this what you do at your secret party? So I'm like, no, it's not. It's, it's a movie. It's a movie, dear. But yeah. Well, um... <laughs> Um, well, anyway, no, uh, first off, you can't talk about the eyes wide shut. <laughs> you go to them, but you can't talk about them. Right, right. right. Or else they don't invite you again. And so anyway, um, anyway, that's, that's neither here nor there. Uh, you know, it, it, I've always believed that where cryptocurrencies are most useful has been the developing world will be the developing world. Uh, there's so much potential for payment systems, identity systems, voting systems, to, to revolutionize business systems all throughout Africa, through East Europe, uh, throughout West Asia. Uh, and basically these countries are ready and willing and demographically are, are just perfect. Like Ethiopia is a great example, 106 million people, 70% are at or under the age of 30. And most of them are online, digitally enabled, and they grew up with ne never having a stable currency and no respect in the local financial system. So when you say on average, 
who do you think would be more inclined to use a cryptocurrency as their primary currency? A 50-year-old Japanese man living in Tokyo who's a salary man or a 26-year-old Ethiopian uh, who's you know, an internet entrepreneur? Uh, so you say, okay, well, that's the demographic over the next 10 years or 20 years where all the growth is going to happen. And you know, the other thing is it's a, a wide open market. I don't have to take customers from EOS or IOTA or anybody to, to win there. I mean, I can bring hundreds of millions of new people into the cryptocurrency space. And as they get wealthier, uh, you know, we're basically their Bitcoin. This is their entry point. A lot of people, I came in through Bitcoin. A lot of people came in through it. And they always have that special relationship and that belief of permanence that Bitcoin will always be there. Uh, for a lot of these people, our hope is their first cryptocurrency will be Cardano. And the first platform that they use will be Cardano. So how do you bring them in? Well, you bring them in through the back door. Basically, you, you create services that are usually on permission ledgers, like supply chain management or whatever it might be, that give them wallets, digital identities, and these types of things. And then once they're wired up, then you say, oh, by the way, you can now use this system over here for a loan or for insurance or for remittances or the, whatever you want. You say, oh, that's pretty cool. And they're already wired into that infrastructure. So it's very easy for them to connect to it, do things with it. Uh, and it's, it's batteries included. It's kind of like being in the Apple ecosystem. Once you're there, everything else kind of works with it. You buy AirPods, it kind of works with your phone. Your watch kind of works with your phone. It's like, it doesn't require a lot of customization. It's all in. And similarly speaking, once you bring them in, they're in that ecosystem and then they can thrive within that ecosystem. So it's just a strategic play. I, I think it's easy to do user acquisition there. It's cheap to do user acquisition there. You get much stronger brand loyalty. Uh, furthermore, it's easier to get bottom-up contributions. You have much cheaper entrepreneurs to work with. I can fund entrepreneurs in these countries uh, for 1 20th to 1 30th the cost of funding a venture in Silicon Valley or New York City. And frankly, startups are a game of numbers uh, You know, because everybody's smart. Everybody has a good idea. Everybody's willing to work hard. Everybody's willing to put in the time. And a lot of these kids are very well educated, in many cases, Western educated. They went to Western schools. So you're saying to yourself, I get the same team and the same starting point for a $25,000 investment in Ethiopia that I could get for $500,000 in San Francisco. Why the fuck don't I just do it 20 times in Ethiopia and I get 20 DAP companies instead of one in San Francisco? What kind of DAPs are you working with like what that was actually one of my questions you know what sort of dapps do you see popping up on this blockchain in the near future well yeah that's why we're starting to do the hackathons because we're having those conversations but there's already been a lot of people and people tend to solve the problems around them so it's regional so for example if they have a lot of problems with the press where free press is being restricted then they tend to say we'd like to have more transparent open communication and whistleblowing and and applications that are censorship resistant. If they have problems with getting information out there, like uh, they, they, they have intermittent internet, there's a lot of people saying maybe we can build some sort of cool way of incentivizing mesh nets or things like that. Uh, if they are trying to build new business models, like let's say Airbnb for vegetables, we actually ran into a guy who's doing that on a blockchain in Ethiopia where Basically, he got all these farmers together and they can sell same day their fruits, their vegetables, whatever they have to restaurants uh, in uh, Addis Ababa. So basically, the restaurant owner will say, I need 500 pounds of carrots. And then it can just match together with farmers and they buy right from the farm and they just show up. And the guy wants to do it on a blockchain so he doesn't have to do this type of infrastructure. And so these don't have to be grand things. Right. No, they but could they're be small, they could be local, but they could be quite meaningful. Right. And they can actually end up growing into quite significant things. Uh, you know, an, another great example, we saw Pharma Trust, <coughs> excuse me, Pharma Trust in Mongolia is trying to solve a really significant problem. They're building a blockchain solution uh, to try to help counterfeit medicine. 18% of the medicine in, er, in uh, uh, the urban areas of Mongolia is adulterated. So that can be expired, contaminated, mislabeled, or in some cases, just counterfeit. And some places, rural areas, 40% of the medicine is adulterated. So could you imagine that, where you're taking your aspirin and you have a one in five chance, it's not even real aspirin. Uh, or you're taking your antibiotics, treat your tuberculosis or your, you know, your pneumonia, and it might not even be real or it could be 10 years expired. It's labeled like it's, it's brand new. So they're trying to track and trace these types of things. So those are real life applications and they're very important. 
And it's generally an area either, you know, different categories, categories where the infrastructure is not good, categories where the, uh, uh, where the government's not so good, category where there's a core service that's just fundamentally missing, a category where they want to replicate a Western business model, but on a small scale, uh, you know, you can just go down the list. And there's, there's hundreds of these types of things that we see. So, you know, the first step is to have hackathons and we just basically expose people to the language and then we do directed training in certain jurisdictions. Uh, and then we just open it up and at some point people will be able to deploy on Cardano and we'll see what the market starts, uh, starts creating. Um, there's certainly a lot of interest in SDOs, security tokens, and there's a lot of interest, of course, in ICOs. Everybody's always interested in capitalization and that will become whether we want it or not. Every ecosystem provokes this. Uh, and, uh, but what's really interesting is the SEO interest is not just unilaterally coming from entrepreneurs, it's actually coming from governments as well. It's been a lot of discussions about how to, especially smaller governments, build compelling capital markets to bring money into the country because they're doing everything right. Their corruption indexes are going down, their government services are going up. Like Georgia is a great example. It used to be one of the most corrupt countries in the entire world. And, and it was one of the hardest places in the world to do business. It was like 116 or something like that. Now it's number six in terms of doing business. And they've improved that in just a 10 year period. So they've gone from one of the most corrupt to the least corrupt and their economy is growing very rapidly, but they're still having difficulty getting capital into the country because you know that lags, it takes some time to build up that reputation. So they're always looking to leapfrog and create new things to bring capital in. So it's a, it's a mixture from the poorest people in Africa to na nation state actors saying, we wanna rebuild our medical records or you know we wanna rebuild our capital markets or these things. And, it's either some Cardano piece of DNA or a Tala piece of DNA or a composition of these things together can help them get there. And it ends up just bringing users and value into the system if we can deliver on that. Will the, will, will the Shelly mainnet need to go live before we start actually seeing these different dApps popping up? Yeah, yeah. it has to. Actually, Gogan has to go live for that because Gogan is the smart contract component. And that's what happens after Shelly. But we're working on Gogan in parallel with Shelly. So the latency between the release of Shelly and Gogan is not going to be significant. Do you think in they'll fact, both today, be before 2020? I hope so. I, I think there's a very strong possibility. Um, the Plutus platform is evolving rapidly uh, and uh, Marlowe is evolving rapidly, which is the core of Gogan for the first release of it. And it's gotten to the point where people can already write smart contracts with it. We're just writing it on a server. And they're testing it. But semantically speaking, extending the scripting language and the, the accounting semantics of, um, of Cardano to, to include Plutus support, it's not really that hard. Uh, so it, it actually does not require significant changes post Shelly for us to bring it in. It's just a, it's just certain things have to line up. So uh, that's a significant upgrade, but it's it's actually not one that takes a lot of time because we're we're doing all that work to get there right now. Uh, Plutus has been being designed now for about three years. There's been a humongous amount of effort that's gone into it. And I think we've gone through almost 20 revisions of the language at this point. How many different programs? I, obviously, Haskell is one, but you, Dab developers will be able to program in, in multiple languages for Cardano, right? Or is it like what, what languages will be available to people to develop on? Right. That's a good question. So the, the problem is that you actually have two different sets of code you have to write for Dabs. And, and this is something we learned from Ethereum. You know, yeah. When we first did Ethereum, we're like, yeah, everything lives in Ethereum, right? Where it's, it's the centralized infrastructure. But then you're like, well, you know, but we have to wire it onto a client and a server and these things. And then we're like, well, how do we do that? Well, in Web3 and JavaScript and these things, it was a very haphazard model and it created a lot of little issues and there was lurking centralization there. So you want to, it always started the same way. I want to create decentralized Uber. So then you go and try to do that. And then it's a thousand times more expensive, a thousand times slower than Uber. And you're like, oh, that's not going to work. Shit. And then you say, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take all the Uber-ish stuff, and we're going to put that on our own server, and then we're going to wire it on to this smart contract that does a few things. And then little by little, you have a smart contract that only runs because you're paying for an Amazon server. <laughs> and so you ask yourself, you're like, is this really a decentralized application at this particular point? So there's kind of an existential thing there, right? Like what, what runs on the server, what runs on the blockchain, can't really get rid of the off-chain code. So we designed Plutus and, and the Cardano smart contract programming model uh, to basically take into account the off-chain code and the on-chain code together and allow you to have one source base. And then you know what's off-chain, you know what's on-chain, the system's aware of it, and they can naturally interact with each other. So it's, it's, it's a much more secure and easy to use programming model. 
So then there's an open question of how open do you want the ecosystem to be at launch? So the problem Vitalik made was he made it too open. And, and so he tried to get as many developers as possible to rush into Ethereum and populate it, which made Ethereum quite popular, but then it led to the DAO and all these other problems. And then the problem is that the DAO didn't just kill Schlocket and say, oh, this is an incompetent company. It badly damaged the brand and the reputation of the Ethereum project. And it led people to believe that Ethereum is not secure, that smart contracts in Ethereum are not secure and so forth. So the sins of your developers and your development community will blow back and damage the reputation of the project. And the victories of that product, that those teams will you know, make the project uh, look good as well. So when you first start, it's actually a really good idea to be a little bit more restrictive with your choices and to have a much tighter ecosystem. And there's some analogies which worked really well, two in particular, Ruby, Ruby on Rails, that ecosystem. You know, Java tried to be everything to everybody, whereas Ruby was very disciplined and very opinionated about how do you do things. And this led to explosive growth and Ruby on Rails was quite successful as a project. The other is actually the iPhone. If you look at uh, the development of iPhone applications, Apple was very draconian and disciplined about their standards and their requirements about what it took to build these things. And they were very disciplined about their launch applications and the first people who got funded. They even worked with, uh, uh, what was it, uh, Kleiner Perkins to create a special fund just to get those initial guys out. So when Gogan first launches, there's Plutus, Haskell, uh, and Marlowe. And Plutus and uh, Marlowe are DSLs for the on-chain code. And you know, they're functional and they're, they're somewhat easy to use. And then the Haskell's for the off-chain code and the Haskell compiled the JavaScript into WebAssembly. So it's very portable. And there's already a big wave of developers that understand that paradigm that are pretty excited to build things there. Uh, so that's step one is get a community, get an ecosystem and build a nice launch wave of applications to really showcase why this paradigm is a great idea and people can do cool and interesting things. Then step two, after you've solidified a little bit and things look good, open it up. And there's two directions to open it up. One direction is make it more in line with the things you can already do in the cryptocurrency space and interoperable with the incumbent standards, in this case, Ethereum. So there's solidity support and you know, these types of things. And then the other direction is make it more in line with mainstream programming languages like Java, C++, JavaScript, and these types of things. So the original strategy for that, is we put $5 million into studying K and seeing what we could do with the K framework and semantic space compilation and these things, but we realized it was just too big to do that. So we scaled that down a little bit. And what we're gonna do is in 2020, add some solution for both of those things. And that could be as simple as, as a side chain, adding EVM support along with WebAssembly support. And then you could write smart contracts in that, uh, in that environment if you wanted to or we could visit a more exotic model. But the point of this extensible system is it's actually not that hard for us to add these types of things in. But my broader point is that it's very, very important that the first impressions of the system, the first wave of dApps in the system, the first wave of developers in the system make a good impression. Right. And that they actually do good things so that the brand can solidify and people actually understand what you're trying to do. That's why we're aggressively doing hackathons. That's why we're courting the Haskell community, which is very large. And you know, these are very skilled developers, a lot of them 10, 15 years of experience, um, a lot of them master's degrees, computer science, PhDs, computer science, a lot of them work at big banks or in the defense industry. They write serious applications and they work a lot around mission critical applications where like they screw up the code, the Boeing jet falls out of the sky or they screw up the code, the Mars rover doesn't work. Those are the kinds of people you want writing the first wave of dApps in your system because that creates the good reference code. And that core also is going to sit around Stack Exchange and answer questions and basically become those expert users that you need when the less skilled people come into the system and they start using the system for the first time. And the, then those people have lots of questions and they need more help. Uh, so uh, basically, it's going to be a functional paradigm in the beginning. Uh, we'll extend that by adding more DSLs to do specific things as, as we go along. And that will always be the case. And then there's two directions we'll go in for the next iteration. One is legacy support, and then the other is mainstream language support. And we have various strategies that we we can implement. Some are more pragmatic, and you know, some are are more aggressive. Uh, we I, I I would have loved to have had 
SBC and K work out because then I would be able just to say we'll support every language easily and it's all great. But that's that that was just too hard and we spent too much time and money on it. Yeah, I <clears throat> see. I want to see as many dApps as possible, but what I don't want to see is Cardano flooded with casinos. <laughs> right. You know, and not only that, it's like it's like it's like saying, well, even if you have these dApps, are are they being used? Are they solving real problems? Because they're not being used. There's no demand for ADA. So it's not doing anything for right. it. It's just bloat. Well, it's, it's that, it's that line. You know, it's it's having yeah. a little something for everybody if possible. That's obviously right. everybody's goal. You just don't, you know, if you look at all the Tron dApps, it's like 90% of them are casinos. And it's like, okay, right. cool. So you've got a million casinos and dice games all over a dApp and it's getting usage. But what purpose does that really solve long term? And, and right, so right, right. I'm holding Cardano to much higher standards, Charles. Uh, <laughs> so... Okay. And, you know, it's a big ecosystem and you can't be everything to everybody and you have to pick and choose your strategies. And, you know, that's the thing is every strategy you pick, there's a strategy you didn't pick. And there's a group of people disagree with that. And that's why there's 3000 cryptocurrencies, you know, vote with your feet, vote with your wallet, pick, pick what, what you agree with. Uh, and we've been very pragmatic uh, where we can be, but we have to be principled in certain areas. And, you know, if you're going to take the time to hire proper computer scientists and language designers and do things the right way, you, you don't half-ass that. You right. just follow it through the, to its logical conclusion. And there are a group of people that currently live outside of the cryptocurrency space who are among the best developers and brightest people in the world. And we have a shot to bring those people into our space for the first time ever. Uh, so let's just go get that demographic and it will add a lot of strength and value to the Cardano ecosystem that, uh, that we ought to have. What are the chances that ADA will work with Ripple and the Interledger protocol? Is there room for a relationship? And if so, how? Thank you, sir. We already, yeah, we already have a relationship with Evan Schwartz and uh, the guys at the W3C. And we're, we're joining the W3C. It's one of those things where we just have to find somebody at IOHK who's willing to go to the meetings. Uh, the Interledger committee is, uh, I think, part of the web payments. I can't remember. And maybe it's an independent committee. But it's got like 300 members. And... Uh, we will likely support something like Interledger at some point. I, I mean, it's not hard to support interoperability bridges. Lightning is another example of one that's materializing. We have a product manager who's exploring that. Uh, so, you, you know, there's interoperability is half a game of science, good engineering, and half a game of pragmatism and just accepting market standards. Uh, so if Interledger turns out to be the standard, then I, I can't go, you know, take the ball and go home and fret. I just have to accept it as it is and say, oh, well, and move on, you know? And so, uh, so we have no ill will there. We have good relationships there. You had a uh, meeting with Aon as well. Did, uh, I haven't heard yeah, anything it, since then. Yeah. This, they had the same situation. You know, we, we met with the Aon team and uh, again, they're great people. They're interesting people to talk to. Uh, it's important to differentiate the two. Uh, Interledger does not have a native token and uh, it, uh, it, it works differently for interoperability than Aon does. And so, uh, they have different philosophies. And again, it remains to be seen uh, what the industry wants. Uh, are they okay with these meta protocols that have toll tokens to move between different systems? Or do they want uh, curated bridges with trusted servers uh, like Interledger? Uh, these are different philosophies. And uh, what we created with Nipopause and, uh, and uh, proof of stake sidechains is actually a trustless uh, non-interactive bridge. It's almost like an atomic cross-chain swap in that respect, where you don't need trusted third parties and you, you don't need a token. You can just move from one system to the other. And we think that's the purest, most philosophically pure way of, uh, of doing things. Uh, and the industry ultimately has to decide what... Uh, where what, do you, what direction do you think that that's going to be? Well, I do think there's great promise for at least a nipa based system. You know, with Fly Client on the, the Bitcoin side, there's certainly discussions around this because it's not just interoperability, like I can listen to and talk to and send value between these different systems. It's also solving the light client problem. We will never get broad scale adoption if you have to download the whole blockchain. It's a self-defeating proposition. You, you, you cannot tell a consumer, you can only use the product after you've downloaded a terabyte of files and process all of them. It, you have to have it be like a cell phone app where it's super easy to get. And, you know, Nipapow is basically enable that future where you can only have a few megabytes and that's it. And then you have the same level of security as if you had the entire chain. So given that it solves the light client problem 
and at the same time, it solves your side chain problem and your operability problem, I think it's very likely that that solution long-term on the proof of work side uh, is, is a strong contender. Uh, that said, there are a lot of different systems and there's a lot of things going on and there's all these meta protocols and there's perverse financial incentives all around. And the other things, we have big maturity problems in the space. People don't like working with each other. People don't like speaking about each other unless they're diminishing each other. Uh, and there's not a lot of adults running some of these prob projects. Ripple at least has adults running the projects, so it's easy to talk to them and work with them. I've said incredibly harsh things about Ripple after they, uh, they put Ben Lasky on their board. They still talk to me and we still have a friendly relationship. Uh, whereas I've said incredibly harsh things about other projects, the mere mention of my name is like, like, you know, mentioning not, uh, you know, Nazis to Jews. You know, right. Like, it's not it's weird. Anywhere, right. Yeah. The, the, yeah. Not, yeah. So, it, yeah. And that's just the way the space operates. And so then that's a barrier to interoperability because interoperability by definition requires people to cooperate right. and agree to common principles. Right. Right. But we'll, we'll get there. We'll have our Wi-Fi moment and then it'll, it'll just work for everybody. I'm still mining Aeon because I, I, I I've been very, yeah interested in in aeon and what their plans are so i'm rooting for some sort of relationship there in the future but uh we'll see um, i mean I, I would i would love to have one and there's definitely a possibility that we could collaborate on the virtual machine side of things they're working with the jvm and they found a way to accelerate the uh, jvm for what they want to do and we are in the market for that for you know basically that as i mentioned there's two different paths right uh, that we're going to do post functional um, we are in the market for something for that and it could be a collaboration with aon that gets us there that would be um, huge news but, for me you know i'll talk you know i'll talk to matt and you know we, we we we're on good terms and uh you know that that's that's a that's the old toronto mafia you know there's trevor kokora and, and uh, matt and anthony diorio and a dozen others are in that circle and i'm on very good terms with all of them that's that's great i i, I would imagine you would be uh, please ask about plans to release an ADA debit card and have ADA ATM machines. Also, please ask about your about progress with Coinbase to buy Cardano with USD. Um, you know, I still have my. I literally, I will pull it. I have this thing in my wallet that I've had that I obviously can't use. But where is it? I have my ADA credit card. Believe it or not. Really? Right here. There's my ADA credit card, if you can see it. Oh, in the... the one from Korea, right? That's the one from Korea. I keep it in my wallet. Can you believe that? Yeah. People use it in Korea, man. People use it in Korea. If I, I ever get a passport, I'm ready to go. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. Uh, yeah. So I, I knew there was a lot of discussions with various vendors the Cardano Foundation has had for, um, for debit cards. There was one that was lined up, but then I think Visa changed some regulations, and then it got a little difficult. But at some point that'll materialize. I, I mean, it, it's it's a nice vanity thing because it's super cool to have like a debit card that says ADA on it. And right. You, you know, I show it to people. It. This is what I love. Yeah. Card on Exactly. And you love showing. I mean, don't believe it. Yeah, it's cool to go to a bar and be able to buy a drink with the money you created. Um, you know, that's that's always a dream, right? But then when you actually break it down, it's a terrible economic prospect because you pay like five percent fees and you know all these other things it's it's not something people actually use a lot and you know there's great there's great evidence like look at the zappo and these other companies everybody's gone down this road they haven't been super successful with it but i know that it's an active area of pursuit and at some point it'll come um there were first was some regulatory hold up and then there's the michael parsons thing with the foundation but now i think they are negotiating something and one vendor was too expensive and then another vendor wasn't but it was a sketchy so you know it's getting done um atms there are some floating around that i believe do support ada uh here and there uh there, there were a few in japan but i don't know if they're lawfully operating uh because of the fsa's regulations uh and they're not hard to do and uh, one thing i really would love to see is a mass atm uh, distribution throughout africa and it'd be really cool to do like an X prize for a three hundred dollar ATM that has lots of cool features and it's open source and people can distribute that. And then I could just go buy a thousand of them and give them away. Uh, but you know we'll, we'll get there. And you know again the, the problem with ATMs is they're they're really terrible investments and in, from the consumer perspective because you you're going to pay between a five to ten percent fee for using that. Right. Uh, you know, and, and this, the whole point of crypto is it should be better than the legacy system, not worse than the legacy system. And if you're paying 
five to 10% fees, then that's much, much worse. I think the fees yeah. offset the speculative nature of the investment for most. You know, if you're if you're able to buy Cardano at eight cents and you expect it to go up significantly over the next six months, even, you know, that five to 10 percent you're paying really doesn't mean a whole hell of a lot if you're getting a 10 X return. That's just obviously right. that's right. Well, even if that's your thesis, though, why did you just buy it on an exchange? Why do you go buy it from an ATM? You'd be surprised. There are some people that just are intimidated by the use of exchanges. That's one of the reasons right. why I'm launching mine, because it's going to be very right. easy for people. I just have to right. figure out how to legally get Cardano on my own damn exchange because everybody's ah. asking. So that's we, my we, hurdle. We, well, we actually, I can I'll put you in contact with Neville. We can certainly help you guys with integration. That, that one's not hard. As for Coinbase, I can't talk about that. We signed an NDA, and so uh, I'll have to punt on that question. Okay. I can speculate, though, if you signed an NDA. <laughs> I'm not saying anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a serious face. I'll leave that alone. Um, all right. Are Japanese agencies and businesses welcome to the idea of using Cardano? Oh yeah, actually there was a Yakiniku place that uh, that uh, just uh, started accepting it. That's run by a very famous celebrity and uh, comedian in uh, Osaka. And there's actually a video I think that Emergo posted on Twitter of them buying uh, Yakiniku, which is like fried meat uh, or cooked meat uh, with uh, with Ada. So there's a lot of Japanese business very excited, and there's a big Japanese Ada community. And uh, you know we're we're trying to work with people to make it easier to accept data uh, and it would be it, it's important to have a turnkey way of accepting it for merchants so it could fit into their POS system and the key is for them to be able to be paid in their local asset uh, for example what BitPay has done where you can accept Bitcoin but be paid in dollars or these types of things uh, so uh, I think crypto.com is is working in that direction and a lot of others are you know at some point working in that direction so uh, in, in Japan in particular, Mergo is leading the charge there, and we're seeing definitely a lot of loyalty. There's also an Ada bar, I think, in Osaka. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, so you, you can go and talk about Ada, and there's, little, there's a picture of Ada Lovelace and everything like that, and all the drinks are Cardano-themed and, uh, and so forth. So, uh, yeah. We're what, is the, what is the stuff I'm hearing about Nicole Kidman? Is this like a joke going around, or is she somehow getting involved with the project, or what? Nicole Kidman? Yeah, yes, somebody said me. something to me, or I saw something That's somewhere. To me. <laughs> I think it might have been on my Twitter. You you travel in different circles than I do, man. <laughs> I, uh, that would be that would be amazing. Maybe, maybe it was the eyes wide shut reference. Maybe, maybe that's what it was. I don't know. Maybe somebody was fishing. Uh, right. Can you ask him what he thinks about the what the best resource is to learn about Cardano for the average person that isn't too technically over everyone's head? Now, you and I talked about this the last time we spoke. I said, you need somebody that can dumb down all this intense brilliance into something that the general public can really swallow. Yeah, that's why the Cardano effect was created. So if they go to the Cardano effect and listen to the first few episodes of it, they do a great job of explaining what is Cardano, why is it important, uh, and uh, they've created some good content there. I couldn't agree more that we need some better onboarding materials, like a nice handout, like the missing user manual uh, and these types of things, but those will come. Um, one of the things we're going to be doing over the summer, it's a, it's a project that we're starting to embark on, uh, is that we're going to actually write um, official Cardano white paper. It's kind of funny. We've written like more than 40 white papers, scientific papers, and all these other things, but we never got in a white Cardano, but we never got around to actually writing like a consolidated, nice, concise paper of, of everything and putting it all in one place. And then once you do that, what you do is you write a non-technical summary of that paper, and then you build a whole corpus of marketing materials around it. Uh, so there's going to be a good product marketing surge that occurs throughout the summer to try to get more concise content. And that's a whole spectrum of things. You need videos, infographics. It'd be nice to have some good three to five minute explainer videos of what is Cardano. And actually, what we might do is partner with some YouTube partners to do that. You know, if you, you go to those vendors like What I Learned and uh, what's that one? Curagast or whatever it is, uh, those starts with a K. There's like a dozen of these five, 10 minute explainers and they explain really complicated things like what is quantum mechanics or what is CRISPR or whatever. And they explain it like for a layman and they have beautiful visuals and these types of things. Like what is the Fermi paradox or, you know, these types of things. And so it'd be really cool to sponsor a whole series or something like that. I think and it'd be wildly powerful, especially as you get closer yeah, exactly. to the launch. But, you know, but, you know, you, you, only, you can only blow your marketing load once. 
and and if you blow it too soon and people come and they get a bad first impression then it's twice as expensive for them to come back and give you a second chance so we are definitely waiting for Shelly to ship and we're yeah. definitely waiting for you know the ecosystem just to be a little bit more mature for that uh, for that event so there's a lot of housekeeping we have to do on the documentation side and these types of things and then once we get that housekeeping done we're going to just blow it all over and, all over uh, chain wise all just over all chain, over. just blow it all oh, over chain wise. Everybody, every everybody, everybody. It's gonna be like it's gonna be like an information bukkake, and, uh, <laughs> and then we're, we're just gonna be we're just gonna be covered in it. We're just gonna be covered in it, okay? Oh my we're god! Well, I will help blow that load all over the place, there, Charles. <laughs> I, I'm like a fire hose. Uh, if you were to sell Cardano <laughs> to an enterprise company, what would you tell them? And the is the main reason for them to adopt Cardano. I don't think Cardano's well suited for enterprises. That's why we created Atala. I, I mean, this is the problem with these damn blockchain projects is that they, the, the open decentralized systems want to go and try to sell themselves to a corporation. And you see to a corporation and you say, oh yeah, 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 come, come and deploy your stuff on my system. And there's a few use cases that may make sense, like maybe fidelity hashes or audit logs or whatever. Uh, but uh, the vast majority of the time, if they need a blockchain, they need the level of control and customization and reversibility and other things that you just simply cannot do with an open system, regardless of what that system is. So you give them a permission system like Fabric, or in our case, Atala, which is our enterprise system that we create, construct it. And, uh, and generally speaking, that solves the enterprise problem and they're, they're happy and ready to go. Um, where Blockchain, open blockchains make sense are when you're talking about a situation where you need something to be truly global. And, and that's usually for financial applications where you want to move something all the way across the world. Or you want to you know, get customer flow all around the world. You want dynamic control of the particular system. So, you know, it's important not to be everything to everybody. It's important to know yourself and know what you can do, what you can't do. So I don't go around trying to sell to businesses uh, Cardano as a like an enterprise blockchain solution. That said, they're you know DApp development and DApps themselves are a business and DApps can exist and they do things. So you know maybe a business actually wants to build DApps and do interesting things like they want to create a loyalty token program and have that be open and they don't want to host the infrastructure. In which case, yeah, you'd sell that particular type of solution and that's a Cardano solution, right? There's no sense for them to go and host that. Uh, so uh, generally, it's a case-by-case -case basis. It depends on what problem they're trying to solve. Uh, and these solutions tend to be multivariate. They tend to, they tend to have a lot of things you have to satisfy at once. And generally, they involve more than just an open system. They involve a database and a server and other actors and all kinds of stuff. And it's just a small component of larger solution. What milestones, obviously, Shelley... In, in Gogan, I guess, are going to be probably, I'm assuming this is going to be your answer, but what milestones do you think must be met before Cardano can be, begin truly rivaling and or competing with the likes of Ethereum? Well, you know, for Ethereum as it is today, um, Gogan and Shelly would be more than sufficient. If we ship that, Ethereum would look like a toy. Uh, you know, this, this is a good system. And uh, once we get side chains in place, uh, there's just nothing compelling about Ethereum. I'd be like, why are, why are you even thinking about it? It's just, it's idiotic to deploy on that platform. But where Ethereum that wants to go, Ethereum 2.0, uh, we need Basho for, uh, for that. And I think we have a lead there. <coughs> Excuse me. That chest cold hasn't quite gone away yet. Um, and where Ethereum wants to go, you know, we need Ouroboros Hydra and, and these types of things. And that research is underway. We'll get that done this year, and get it in, in 2020. Uh, but uh, no, I, 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 the nice part about wh where this project is at is that we know all the big problems and we kind of have a pretty good clue about where the world is going. And there's a lot of stuff that the world's not even talking about that is super important for cryptocurrencies. Like if you take a big step back and you say, throw the blockchain away, throw the cryptocurrency away, and you go to the atoms of the financial world, they're called transactions. And if you look at a transaction, there's four things that branch off from it. So first, transactions have to carry something. So what do they carry? Assets, information or assets. Then second, transactions don't just happen. They're between entities, parties, one-to-one, one-to-many, many-to-many. So Alice to Bob, 
Microsoft to Google, Microsoft to all of its employees, a company to all of its shareholders, et cetera, et cetera, right? There's entities, so that's the second component. Third, you have stories. You don't just send something. If I sent you a Bitcoin, I wouldn't just send you a Bitcoin. Why, why did I send you 11 grand? Well, maybe I bought something from you. Maybe I'm giving you a loan. You know, maybe, uh, maybe we have some deal we worked out. The point is there's metadata associated with the transaction. There's a story of the transaction. And then finally, you have compliance. All of these things, the story, the entities, the asset, the geography, all these things live within a regulatory environment. So that is the building block of the entire financial world. Whether you're on a blockchain, on JP Morgan Chase's servers, or whether you're on Swift, whatever. Okay, so then when you look at that, you say, okay, well, there are transaction patterns. There's push, that's what Bitcoin does. You push value to somebody, but then you also have pull transactions. Those are subscriptions. And these stuff, you can't do that with cryptocurrencies. It's not easy. Then you have things like contingent settlement, where you say it's only going to settle if A, B, and C are true, or D are true, whatever. Then you have a situation where you say it's conditional, where you say, I'm going to put my address out of there, but you can't send me money until you contact me and I approve it, for example. Okay, so all these transaction patterns that exist, and there's this embedding where you'd like to embed metadata, you'd like to embed compliance information, you'd like to embed identity, these types of things into the transaction. Right now, cryptocurrency systems are not well suited to do these types of things. So everybody's like, well, what, you know, how do you compete with Ethereum? It's like, that's a done deal. We know how to do that. We know how to outcompete everybody who's in the market. But that's not the bar. That's a pretty low bar. That's like saying you're the tallest midget. I want to play basketball, <laughs> you know, you know, it's, I, and, and that means I got to be, wife now, Charles. Is that what you're trying to... <laughs> yeah, I, I want to, I want to play basketball, man. And so I got to be a lot taller. So I, you got the FATF regs that are coming in. You, you, you got what the G20 is talking about. You got all, you know, new compliance things that are right around the corner. You got all the banks are going to start asking about things. So how the hell are you going to prove that you own something? How are you going to embed the story of the transaction and the transaction that's still private and safe? How are you going to actually make your transactions compliant with something? You know, so you have to have a strategy for that. And no one's talking about that. How do you do subscriptions? How do you do contingent settlement? How do you do conditional settlement? These types of things. If you run a foundation, how do you make sure that only you only get money from people you're allowed to take money from and you don't have to go through a huge process? That's all automated and you don't have to do any work for that particular type of thing. That'd right? be real nice. So, exactly. You see, so, so, and I'll give you a real life example. Let's say you run an exchange. So right now your security is front-ended. So people create accounts, they go through KYC, and maybe they use one-factor, two-factor authentication to get in. But once somebody's broken into the account, they're in God mode. They can just send an address and say, okay, uh, crypto cry, I want to withdraw all my money. And they say, okay, there you go. But if you can embed identity into transactions, you could say, great, I'm only going to withdraw to addresses that are signed with your identifier. So even if the account gets compromised, they're not going to have the PGP key or the identifier that was registered on the, uh, on the exchange. It's a completely separate credential. So then they'll say, no, 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 I want to withdraw to this thing without it. You say, sorry, that's our policy. We only withdraw to verified addresses. So sign the address with your identifier. If it's, you can't embed it, we can't withdraw to it. It's your problem. You know, the fact that you're saying all this, A, I've got, this would solve so many issues, uh, but th does this process, what you're saying right now, does that have anything to do with maybe some of the discussions you might be having with Polymath? Like, what can you say about your relationship with Polymath and what, right. because we're actually looking to potentially have an STO through with Polymath. And so it'd be real interesting to find out, like, if, you know, what, what that relationship yeah. is. Yeah, Polly's great. And, and, and this is one of the reasons I became a consultant with Polly is that I wanted to learn more about the regulated side of the space because no one gives these guys any 10 or 11 care. It's, it's, it's either your Ned Flanders and your Ripple and you, you just say whatever they want, they get Oakley Doakley. Or you're Monero and fuck the system, burn everything down. That's the dichotomy of our space, right? <laughs> right. And, and the reality is that we can have our cake and eat it too. At the end of the day, I can have transactions that from the outside look a lot like a Bitcoin transaction. They're just, they're just some encrypted noise that no one from the outside understands anything about and the asset. So you look at it, you're like, ah, oh, it's a normal transaction. But embedded within it is like a hash of all the metadata unsigned, the encrypted did which is connected to your real life identity, uh, a whole bunch of compliance information that's been hashed and signed by the compliance agent and these things. 
Outside party have no idea what it is. Forensically, they can never know. But then if an auditor comes in, a regulator comes in, the parties involved in that transaction would be able to de-anonymize it and say, yeah, here's all the audit trail for that. And they say, oh, okay, yeah, everything's in compliance. We're totally cool. And what it means, you're in compliance, but you retain your privacy. And, and nobody's the wiser in this type of thing. So we can build systems like that. So that's the advantage of working with people and talking to people like Polymath and dozens of others is it gives you a sense of what you need to be able to do long term. And that is the real war for what will be the useful and successful cryptocurrency. Because five years down the road, everything's going to be different, man. I agree. The tech is going to be crazy different. There's going to be multi-party computation, this and zero knowledge, that and like shit you've never even seen or heard of and next generation crypto up your ass and post quantum this and it's going to be a word salad of craziness okay right. the buzzwords aren't going to stop and that's fine that's going to be there but what's really going to differentiate the top 10 cryptocurrencies from the rest is that they're going to have liquidity and be traded and be useful and they're only going to be allowed to be traded have the liquidity and be useful because they're accepted and they're only going to be accepted is if there's a path to compliance somewhere Totally and agree. so right and right now we're living in this world where everybody has this mindset of the only way to do that is to just turn over the keys of the Ferrari to the government, let them run everything. And what I'm trying to tell everybody is if you're really smart about it, you can build a system that looks like Bitcoin in terms of its ethics and its principles and be totally decentralized. And it doesn't actually destroy your privacy and, it, and no one can reverse the transactions and these types of things. But actually, it's enough to make the government happy, and it's enough to make you know the world economic system happy, and so forth. And because we have Plutus, and because we we thought about the transaction in a very atomic way, we're not going to be able to do so much more. So that's the real fight to win over the next five years, not the smart contract fight or the scalability fight. Or the that's just technology, and you know that's getting done, and we and everybody else are doing it. And you know, there's no longer USP just achieving that. That's like saying you have a 500 horsepower engine. Everybody's got a 500 horsepower engine. You don't win that fight, right? Mine's it's 590. Be, yeah, my, yeah, mine's 400. I, I got a, I got a CT6. Let's run uh, them. But, Let's run them, Charles. There we go. You know, and so, so that, that's where we're at. <laughs> uh, please ask him if he thinks Libra is a threat to projects like Ripple who are not building an ecosystem like we all know Cardano is. Is Libra a threat to uh, Ripple? Yeah, people are wondering if you think that's going to be a threat to Ripple. Well, I mean, they focus on different demographics. Um, the whole value proposition of Libra is we have 3 billion or however billion people use messengers, like a massive fuck ton of people. Right. And, and suddenly they're going to wake up and now it's a cryptocurrency wallet and, and it comes preloaded with, uh, with their shit. Right. Uh, and they can use it as a payment system. It's like, okay, great. Um, I don't know how that somehow kills XRP because the whole marketing of XRP is it's not a currency and it's not necessary out of than a DDoS protection system. And it's so primarily it's for like 10,000 plus dollar transactions isn't it i mean it's not uh, necessarily for retail i you know who knows you know ripple is always like we're a technology company and we have nothing to do with xrp out of the fact that it, it made us billions of dollars and we hold billions of dollars of it mm -hmm. um i don't know you know it's it's their fight to have but they focus on banks facebook is focusing on consumers they're different client verticals so i i don't see how these things are gonna you know, conflict with each other I think Libra is, is more terrifying to the stable coins in the industry, like the Tethers. Or exactly. Other guy. I agree. Uh, and that it's certainly eating a lot out of their lunch. But remember that Libra comes with an enormous regulatory war that they're now going to have to fight. And, they're, and the, the, that's going to be a big battle and it's going to be fun to watch. Well, you know, one of the big reasons why I even started on the idea of, of Crow's Nest was because of all of the regulation and how I saw... You know, that with 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 all the exchanges and like you said, with AML KYC ever growing ever more important to everybody right. across all landscapes, and that being a necessity, you know, I, and the way everybody's just oh well, I'm going to launch an exchange in this country or that country, and you know, even initially, a lot of people were like, oh, you should set up your company in Nevis, and you should do everything offshore, and I'm like, no, there's no, there's it doesn't matter where you are. You might as well do it where you're from, and like because the SEC doesn't give a shit where you're located or what you're doing. And if you're not properly 
handling your AMLKYC, you're going to be screwed. And a lot of these different cryptocurrencies that are trying to establish these pipelines through, you know, international waters and trying to evade things are like the the privacy coins. You know, I told everybody, like, I don't see a lot of these privacy coins really doing that well because they're all going to become like this underground railroad of crypto. And, and it's just not necessarily something that I see as being fruitful for anyone in the grand scheme of things moving forward. Well, it, well I mean, it, they are necessary and uh, they're a necessary evil for the space. And I, I don't necessarily think that privacy coins are are bad. Uh, I, I, I think that there's dystopian governments everywhere and there are certainly people who don't give a shit about their citizens and are willing to just ban all things. Uh, like for example, if you live in India, Right now, there's an, an actual legitimate conversation of saying if you use Bitcoin, you could spend 10 years in jail. Absolutely uh, awesome. Uh, it's just, it's insanity, right? So if, if somebody was saying, I live in India, I want to be a cryptocurrency user, my first advice was don't, but as you know, no, I'm going to do it. I'd say you should probably use Zcash or Monero or something, use some privacy coin. What Not reason do you, th what reason they, do they even have for that mentality? What reason was there to ban marijuana? I mean, sometimes people just do crazy things, you know, and they just, they just, <laughs> I, I don't know. You know, it's just, it's, it, it's just people living in the past, people having regressive ideas. Uh, some people believe the earth is flat. And, I know, you know I, I love it. <laughs> I know, right? It is and, flat, yeah. Charles. What are you talking about? Well, it's I say, well, we'll go to Antarctica together. We'll figure this shit out. We'll find we'll find the ice wall. <laughs> it, it's all fake, man. Um, <coughs> okay. Uh, wow, we've been. It's an hour and a half almost already. Time has flown. Um, I think I got through all of these questions, and there have been no more super chat questions. I think we've done a really good job at, at answering a lot of this stuff. Every time I talk to you, man, I got to like go out and buy more Cardano. <laughs> just, well, I never get financial advice. I oh, mean, absolutely I not. Focus. Absolutely not. I just, I just focus on the technology. And uh, I you know, have my own goal of how much I want to have accumulated before Shelly launches and and just, you know, just just have because. you tried out um, have you tried out the self node yet? It's super easy to install. And, uh, we have a testnet website and so forth. I have not, but I'm more than willing. Like I, I wanted to be like a, like a, um, what did you call it? You know, basically like the pool, pool it's... validator node or whatever. That's what I was looking to get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me see. I think it's testnet.iohk.io. Let me let me check real quick uh, the the URL. I want to get it right. Um, Might not be. Jer, uh, Jer forgot to send it to me. All right. Well, I'll send it to you for the show notes, the uh, yeah. the link to the testnet website. I just can't remember off the top of my head with the, but you should go there and download all the stuff and I see if you will. file and uh, play around with it. I mean, it's pretty cool. You're like God mode. So basically you can launch it with as many nodes as you want and uh, basically create your own ADA out of thin air, like, like, you know, crypto crow uh, ADA and uh, distribute and that was one connection. of my dreams man I wanted to create the crow coin on Cardano's <laughs> blockchain but uh, nobody you can, can delegate do. to different nodes and you can actually see how the delegation works and you know these types of things and actually watch the protocol running so it's like a whole Cardano network just on your own computer That's uh, and it's 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 really cool to, it's almost like SimCity or something for uh, for Cardano yeah, I want to. I definitely want to play around more and more of that. I'm. I'm actually supposed to be setting up like I want to set up a matrix a matrix AI validator node at some point and kind of show people how to do that as well. Because I, I really I like matrix. I think you know there there are different projects that I want to get more involved. In. I mean, I'm so busy. I'm like you. I'm not traveling the world, but I've got so much stuff going on, and I want to like I want to be able to dive in deeper and kind of educate people on how right. a lot of this stuff works. So, um, one last question, Charles. You know it's coming. And that is. You're going to come to Chainwise? <laughs> I, will make, I will make best effort. November is always a busy month. It's also my birthday. Is in November. Mine too, man. Oh, no shit. I was born on the 5th of November. I'm the 22nd. The 22nd. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, man. Five, five is cooler, you know, because it's Guy Fox Day. You know, remember, remember the 5th of November? That's the yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, yeah. I will I will hound you for confirmation as we get closer. 
And, yeah, uh, please do, please do. And, and, and thank you so much for having me on. I really do appreciate it. I, I, it's an honor to have you anytime. Uh, absolutely anytime. And as we get closer to Shelly and the more things are happening and changing, obviously I love tuning into your AMAs. For those of you guys that don't know, I mean, obviously you can tune into his channel and, and the Cardano channel. He's always going live with AMAs, sometimes pretty late at night too. So I, I'm, I, I'm pretty sure they're late at night. Um, well, it's, uh, it depends. I rotate. So I do some in America time, and then I do some that are set for Asia. So I do late at night United States, but it's it's morning or afternoon in Asia. Yeah, see, the, but those know. work for me because I'm typically up to like 3 a.m. anyway. So <laughs> Well, there you go. So you're on Asia time. Right, Asia. exactly. Uh, right. So, look, Charles, it's always such a pleasure, man. You're like one of the coolest, smartest dudes on the planet, and it's always just a treat to have you and uh, just to learn as much as we can from you. So, I mean, even outside of Cardano, there's always a lesson to be learned when you're talking. So... Um, thank you for being you and uh, for everybody else curl your coins and uh, make sure you like and subscribe and hit all this and that and join me for the next one and uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend my friend thank you so much have a wonderful night cheers see you guys till next time curl your coins we'll see you again soon